Without further ado, I'd like to thank Audrey Joseph for joining me on the stage. So Audrey, please tell us a little bit about where you grew up and a bit about your family. So I'm from Brooklyn. I grew up in a neighborhood that was bordering Crown Heights and Bedford Stuyvesant, so I grew up in the ghetto, a poor ghetto. Um, my father was a lawyer who did a lot of civil rights work, and my mother was my mother, and I had a kid brother. You've depicted Brooklyn as a very dynamic place when you were growing up. In our pre-interview, you called it a tough neighborhood with a lot of love. How so? It's true. The whole world's a suburb of Brooklyn, <laughs> um, truly. Brooklyn is just, um, it's the fourth largest city in the United States, and it's only a borough of New York. Uh, it's very diverse. Every neighborhood has its dynamic. I grew up in a neighborhood that was full of gangs, and you learned how to you learned how to live on the streets, pretty much. You walked down the street, you looked into the store windows to see who was following you, and you learned how to take care of yourself by the time you went to school. And most of us started school at five, so it was diverse, lots of people. I, my neighbor was primarily black, Puerto Rican, and our family. And uh, so it was dynamic, but if something happened, everyone showed up. So if someone got sick, everyone showed up. If somebody died, everybody showed up. Uh, everybody showed up for everything. You depicted a game you used to play where you would jump from porch to porch. Oh, was climbing that? porches. So in New York in the winter, it snows. <laughs> and so there were two primary games we played on our block. One was to build forts out of snow and have snowball wars. Now some people had snowball fights. We had full on war. Um, and then there was, in my neighborhood in Brooklyn, there were apartment house buildings on the corners. And in the middle were these houses that people lived in. And you had to walk up a flight of stairs to get to the porch. So the idea was you started at the end of the block and someone said go, and you ran all the way down the block, jumping porches. So you run along the porch, jump over, run along the porch, jump over. We'd race, climbing porches. That's how we entertained ourselves. <laughs> In school, you produced school programs. Please tell us about that. New York was famous for something called Sing, and they made a movie about it called Sing, which I guess became a B-movie. But um, Sing was a competition between the grades. So junior, sophomore, uh, seniors, and freshmen, your high school had freshmen. And the competition was, uh, it's, you had to put on a show. You had to write the music, you had to write the lyrics, you had to do the scenery, do the props, do the choreography, create all the acting, and put on the show. It was a competition. So that's how I got involved with Sing. Um, when I was a junior, our class won. Juniors never won, only seniors won. And it was a big deal. Um, I think also our class was different because we were really bad kids. And we didn't do things in a timely fashion. So we did something like we broke into the school at night so we could finish our scenery. I mean, literally broke the windows in the gym to get in. So. That's how, I mean, we did great shows at Sam. They don't do that anymore. But. That's a shame. But you danced on Broadway and on American Bandstand. Oh, stop. Please share that. Yeah. Well, look at the reaction. Look at the reaction and love you for it. Yeah, let me share. <laughs> I was on Broadway for five minutes. No, I, I was part of a chorus line that was, um, we did a show called Floor of the Red Menace, and the, uh, the lead in the show was Liza Minnelli. It was her first Broadway show, and I was part of a group that danced in the chorus line. I was a dancer. Um, and the show opened and it closed. It was about seven weeks, I think we did. Um, an American Bandstand. In New York, there was a show called Big Beat. It was um, hosted by a guy named Alan Freed, who was very much like American Bandstand. At the time, it was as popular as American Bandstand when American Bandstand was first coming up. And they would trade, so 
we went to Philadelphia and went on American Bandstand. And interestingly enough, a little side tidbit, um, more than 50% of the kids on American Bandstand were gay. And I was 14. And I knew I was gay when I was 14. And I saw these kids from TV that were gay too. It was pretty awesome. <laughs> How were you going to nightclubs at age six? At age, oh. <laughs> my father was, two ways. My father was a lawyer for a club. It was called Town Hill. And it was a black club up at the top of this hill in bed -Stuy. And often he, they'd call him up and, you know, he, I always tagged along with my dad wherever he went. And I remember that he took me to the club one night and I think the group that was playing was the Drifters. And so they weren't, when they were doing their nightclub act, they just weren't a singing group. They also did, you know, comedy and other things. And I remember this guy saying, what you eating there? Chicken, shit, man, I love chicken. I got a leg in each hand and a breast in my mouth. <laughs> there was another club called Ben Massick's Town and Country. I mean, all the clubs in Brooklyn were called Town something or other. And I remember going there one night, and there was a show called The Jewel Box Review, and all these gorgeous chorus girls came out on stage, and the MC was this very sharp gentleman in a tuxedo. Turns out the gentleman was a dyke named Stormy, and all the gorgeous girls were men. Huh. <laughs> and so, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> What dating advice did your grandmothers have for you? <laughs> My father's mother always wanted me to come over to her house on any night that I had a date, especially when I was you know, younger, like you know, 15, 16, or whatever. She used to uh, make something to eat, and it was always infused with like massive amounts of garlic especially if I was going to go to the movies with someone. This way she would ensure that no one would kiss me. Right, exactly. But my mother's mother was a little different. She just wanted to make sure they had a job. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about the gay scene, the leather SM scene in New York City, as you experienced it. Well, I came out into the leather scene with with my dear friend, Sashi Hyatt, who some of you may know. Um, and uh, Sashi, for those of you who don't know, the first International Miss Leather Travel Fund is named Sashi. And she was Judy Tolling McCarthy's partner when Judy won Hymns and One. So Sashi and I were, I don't know, in high school, I guess. We discovered the leather scene. We discovered accoutrements first. You know, like dildos and handcuffs and things like that. And then we went searching. The leather scene in New York then was very underground. But if you got through the door and you got underground, it was alive, it was vibrant, and it was super hot, super sexy because it was so clandestine. So going to the Hellflyer Club or any other party, everything in the world was a dungeon or it looked like a dungeon. Um, it was family. All of a sudden, you got taken into a group of people where you had a common interest. And when you walked out into the light, you didn't know each other. But if you needed something, um, or something was going down with you, or you needed advice, everyone stepped up to the plate. Um, it was an interesting kind of family that looked almost, I felt like they looked in my soul. And they were willing to teach and, and they, you know, help you get experience. and chastise you when you're doing something wrong, but it was a very interesting thing. The leather bars that existed were not really leather bars. They were more like leather costumes, as opposed to people really living the life or being in the lifestyle. It was more about men being butch or women being butch. It wasn't about really practicing. That's kind of what it was like when I first met, got into it. How did you get past the barriers to get into that, to get into those very private places? There was a shop on West Street 
um, north of Christopher. And it was a very small shop. And we walked in, Sasha and I walked in, and they sold all kinds of things. It was kind of like a head shop. Uh, they sold cock rings, uh, you know, little things like that. We, walked, we knew that behind the door, behind the counter, was the entrance to the club. We walked in and said, we know what's there, we want to go in. And they said, you have a lot of balls, and they opened the door. And that's really how we got in. You know, pretty much. So that's how we got in. Once you're in and you know people, it wasn't that hard afterwards. Is there anyone particularly memorable that comes to mind from that time? Um, there was a man named Albert Krauss that, um, those of you from Chicago, uh, you might have known him. He was the president of Hellfire in Chicago, close friends of Chuck Renslow. Um, he passed a long time ago. I met Albert Krauss in New York. And um, he stands out because, in one way, because he really liked me. And I don't think he liked girls very much, but he really liked me. Um, I guess I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> well, please tell us how you came to work in the nightclubs. Uh, well, I, uh, I was going to college and I was working part time. Um, and I was working for a company. Uh, a girl who worked in my department, her boyfriend inherited $10,000. And she knew I had done dancing. I was a dancer. So she came up to me and said to me, my boyfriend just inherited $10,000 and he wants to open a nightclub. And you're in show business, so you must know how to do it. So could you meet with us and tell us? And I said, oh, sure. I didn't know anything about it. Um, but I wasn't going to admit that I didn't know anything about it. So after work that night, I went to my local neighborhood disco, walked in the door, and some guy came up to me. His name was Joe, and he, I was dressed for work. You know, I had, I had a skirt on and stuff. I was dressed for work. And he said, what are you doing here? Um, and what do you want? So I told him. I fessed up and told him what I was doing there. And he laughed. And he said, you got to meet my son. He owns this place. So he introduced me to this guy, Barry. We hung out all night, drinking a lot. And the next day I went, quit my job, and went to work for Barry. <laughs> That's how I got into nightclubs. You attended Woodstock. Please tell us a bit about that. <laughs> what is there to say about Woodstock? Why do you remember it? Yeah. Uh, I remember a lot of it. Um, it was in this nightclub that I was working with. The guy who put Woodstock together actually lived across the street and literally across the street from the nightclub. And we had heard about it um, a lot. So I really wanted to go. Um, he had given me three tickets, one for each day, and I still have them. Um, we drove, I drove up with uh, a girl named Diane, and we drove up in my Mustang, which was a bucket seat, two-seater car at the time. <laughs> and um, we drove up to Woodstock. And we got there early, and it was amazing, except for the fact that there was no water. There was no water there at all. Um, I had a five-gallon gas can in my trunk, and we dumped out the gas and cleaned it out and filled it full of water. Oh, God. I had more water than I had more water than anybody, but yeah. There was no water there at all, but it was an amazing place of crazy people who were being probably totally free for the first time in their lives. Um, I had the opportunity to meet a lot of people from communes from New Mexico and Arizona. Um, Hog Farm was there, Buffalo and Morningstar. Uh, they fed us pretty much. They came with like a truckload of brown rice, so you ate a lot of rice. And, um, it was the most amazing experience probably of, in my whole life. I've had a lot of amazing experiences. But to wake up in the morning to hear Grace Slick or Janis Joplin singing, oh my God. go to bed at night, I mean, it was just 
you know, it was amazing. Jimi Hendrix and Crosby, Stills and Nash and anyone who was anybody and people who were nobody at the time that became somebody. Um, it was, it had a half a million people there. Um, it was a city. It produced a newspaper, which was a mimeographed sheet of paper, but it was a newspaper. There were babies born there. Um, I think one of the most memorable moments for me, I think funny, was uh, the, uh, the MCs were a guy named Wavy Gravy and a guy named Chip Monk. Um, and I remember Chip Monk coming out on the stage one night and going, okay, I have an announcement to make here. Uh, anyone who's doing the green flat acid, go to the medical tent. The double dome purple Osleys or the white lightnings are good, but the green flats have strychnine in them. And I was floored, like, it's like it's okay to do drugs. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, those are the kinds of announcements they were making. <laughs> I met people from all over the country. It was an amazing experience. I didn't bathe for a week. Um, I had water, so I brushed my teeth, but that was a bad, but I had gasoline water, but I had water, and I brushed my teeth, and he said, ugh, you're a pussy. Um, <laughs> Prima Donna, I think. So, um, yeah, I, it was amazing. Um, there was one night when it rained, and of course, the car had bucket seats. It was really uncomfortable sleeping in the car. And we didn't bring a tent. I mean, we didn't think about a tent. I'm from Brooklyn. There's no tent, no camping, no nothing. So we slept under the car in a, in a bed of mud. It was... <laughs> it was I made a lot of friends there that ended up being my friends for life. It was pretty, pretty cool. Absolutely incredible. But you once drove a cab. How did that happen? I was starving. <laughs> and I needed a job. So I drove a cab. I drove, I did a lot of stuff to work my way through school and to support myself when I was trying to get into the music business. So I bartended and I drove a cab. I was the second female cab driver in New York. The uh, first woman was from the Bronx, and I was from Brooklyn, and uh, it was interesting because my hair was probably longer than it is now, and I made, I made really good money. Guys would give me great tips and their business cards. So, <laughs> like, I can take you away from all of this. Okay, <laughs> give me the money. But, that's how I drove a cab. And driving a cab, actually, um, I not only supported me at one point, I so supported a group that, um, we, we lived in a residential hotel. There was a bunch of us living in one hotel room. <laughs> so um, I, was, I made enough money to buy spaghetti for everybody. But um, I supported, a, I helped support, one is the support people for a musical group, which later, later became Chic. And it was probably the first gold 12 inch single ever, Dance, 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 Go Shoot. But we all, yeah, we all lived in that room together. The boys would go out and open their guitar cases and play music for money. I, I drove a cab. Um, we did what we had to do. And it was, it was, there was an air, there was an air of community, more on the commune than the itty part. But there was an air of community of being in a commune constantly through, I don't know, the middle 60s to the middle 70s, right before disco hit. So um, people just did that. I, I mean, it, it wasn't that I was unique in doing that. That's what people did. Fascinating. How did you come to work in the music industry? Chic. <laughs> so um, it, this, the interesting story is this. In 1976, New York was going to put on an event called Operation Sail to celebrate the 200th anniversary of America and all the tall ships were coming into the harbor. In 1975, they put out a call to musicians to remake the Rodgers and Hart song, I Like Manhattan, not that song. So we put in a bid and won the bid because we asked for practically no money. And they gave us the job, and they gave, set us up in a studio, and we, you know, made that song kind of into a pop song. 
and they let us create an instrumental for the B-side, and we called it Unique New York. Well, the city went bust on the Big Mac bonds, literally New York declared bankruptcy at that time, and they couldn't pay us. So they gave us the tape of the B-side, because we didn't have the rights to the Rogers and Hart song. Our drummer got a job as a janitor um, in a recording studio, and when he went in at three in the morning to clean the studio, we all went with him, <laughs> and we put the tape in the machine, and we started you know, doing stuff, like adding vocals and hand claps, and we added a horn section, and that song is the song that became Dance, Dance, Dance by Sheep. Um, we were starving, literally, and this guy, Roger Bell, um, came up to us and he said, that's a really good song. He said, we should try and sell it. So he took it to a record store, and the dude at the record store thought it was such a great piece of music that he pressed it into a record, and it had a white label with a turtle on it. It was called Turtle Productions Dance, Dance, Dance by the Big Apple Band. That's what we called ourselves. We had no idea. Um, the uh, vice president of single sales, which is a promotional division of Buddha Records, heard it and thought it was a hit, but he knew it was wrong for his label. So, and he couldn't do anything about it because he worked for Buddha. So he got another guy to shop it to all the record labels and Atlantic Records bought it. And they changed the group's name to Sheik. And they put it out as Dance, 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 Yowzy, Yowza. That was the name of the song. And uh, we got $5,000, which we promptly divided among 11 people. <laughs> there were 11 of us. It was more money than God, let me tell you, at the time. And it was put out, and they had this idea. They were, the industry was trying to increase the fidelity of sound. So they decided to press the single on a 45 RPM speed, but on a larger disc, on a 12-inch disc. So it was the first gold 12-inch single ever. It wasn't the first 12-inch 12, 12 single, it was the first one that ever went gold. So it went gold, and all of a sudden, we were famous in like five minutes. It was, it was like amazing. Um, so that's kind of how I got into the record business. They thought we had some kind of secret formula about how to make music, actually, we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> Absolutely no idea, we just, you know. But you knew Donna Summer, and you produced Sister Sledge. Please, how did that happen? Well, Sister Sledge is easy. They were the backup singers for Sheik. So Sheik, so Sheik was a very interesting group. All the people in Sheik were studio musicians. They also played weddings, bar mitzvahs, funerals. I mean, you know, they played, they were pit musicians on Broadway. Musicians are starving people. They do whatever they can to, uh, to stay alive. So, for instance, one of our background singers was Luther Vandross. And if you look at the first record, you will see his name on, on the record. So, it's your mic. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so, that, so that's how we went. When we hit it with Chic, with Dance, 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 we put out a second single called Everybody Dance, and then we put out a second album. And on that album was Good Times and Chic Look Break, and um, those songs. And, our, and act, we had, a, we were still cost conscious because the way the record labels paid you in those days, they paid you for the first record after you put the second record out. And they only gave you a certain amount of studio time that, that you could use. So we decided to maximize it. Um, and we took the background singers and we did Sister Sledge. And, and you can hear when he's the greatest dancer or that song, We Are Family, you can hear in the song uh, one of the girls going, play it, Nard. Well, that was Bernard Edwards from Chic on the bass. So uh, it's an interesting thing. That's kind of how that, and Donna, uh, the way I met Donna Summer was, um, when I was in that nightclub, one of the business partners was a guy named Lou Sedano. And, you know, he was a money guy. It was Brooklyn, it was, you know, 
He had a garbage company. He was the mafia. I guess he had a son named Bruce. And Bruce wanted to be in, uh, in the music business, and he had a group called Brooklyn Dreams, which later became Brooklyn Bridge. And it was produced by Tommy James from Tommy James and the Shondells. And they became a pretty famous group for their time. Bruce met this up-and-coming singer named Donna, and um, he fell in love, and they got married. And that's how I met Donna Summer, before she was Donna Summer. Um, his family, however, didn't approve. And it's a very Sicilian family, and so they had a wake for him. <laughs> oh, yeah, they did. Of course, after they had their first child, um, Bruce's mother announced that I have a grandchild, fuck you all, I'm taking the kid back, and so they made up. But yeah, so that's how I, that's how I met Donna Summer. She was married to Bruce Sedano. But you, you mentioned actually getting together with her relatively shortly before she died. Yeah, about three years ago, Donna came here um, to do a, she was, she came out with a new album after not having an album for years. And she was doing a, she did a show at the Paramount Theater in Oakland. Um, and she did a radio station reception at the W Hotel here, and I was invited to it. Um, and I remember I walked in. They invited me in. I went to the green room, and everyone's there all about Donna Summer. Uh, and I walked in, and I was looking for Bruce. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't seen him in years. I was like, me and Bruce was like, <laughs> you know, and everyone's like, what is she doing and why, you know? <laughs> so, uh, so Donna walked over to us and talked with us a little bit. But for me, it was more about, you know, regrouping with Bruce, who I hadn't seen in a really long time, than it was about her. Well, we share an interesting statistic in that we are both survivors of terrorist attacks. Please, tell us what happened to you. Um, uh, April 5th, 1982, I was asleep. I had a loft apartment in an old bank building. It's mind of its own. <laughs> I had a loft apartment in an old bank building, and I'm very lucky that it was an old bank building. It was uh, converted in New York, they called them AR apartments, artists and residents. And I had a recording studio in my apartment. I was there with my dog. And a girlfriend who I'd been fighting with came over that night and actually stayed over. And um, I guess I took a value to go to sleep. And um, of course, I couldn't listen to her anymore. <laughs> and um, she was waking me up. You know, something's wrong, something's wrong, something's wrong. Um, what had happened was uh, someone planted a plastic bomb in a restaurant that was attached to the building. And the bomb went off. And it went off with such force that it blew the fire escapes off the building. Oh my God. And it was the PLO, and they took credit for it. Um, there were 20 locks in the building, each rented by one person. So there were 20 of us that lived in the building. Seven of my neighbors died. Um, because it was an old bank building, the ceilings were very high. And you know, New York's cold in the winter, so a lot of people had dropped their ceiling. Now the ceiling in my bathroom was dropped, but not in the rest of my place. Um, and so the explosion caused a fire, and the fire went up through the walls and hit the drop ceilings. In the case of one person, it traveled through the drop ceiling down the wall, and she was in bed and incinerated her in her bed. Um, so I got out with my dog and my girlfriend, who, uh, passed out on me along the way, and I was dragging, I was on the third floor, and I was dragging her through the fire to get out of the building. But I got out, and, um, and actually, I got out with help. Uh, the building was pretty much cleared of people, and there were two guys that lived across the street, and one of them said, where's Audrey? I sent a fireman into the building uh, to look for more people. And what had happened, Linda, that's the girl I was with at the time, I had, was dragging her along, and she was dead weight, and I couldn't drag her anymore because um, when you have smoke inhalation, you feel like your chest on fire. So I threw her down a flight of stairs. I figured, as she'll break a leg, at least she'll be alive. And they found her at the bottom of the stairs, and they carried her out. And they said, is this the girl? And he said, no. 
And they said, oh my God, there's more people in the building. And so the firemen came back in and had me and my dog and threw in his best as co-rows, walked us through the fire. Um, I spent four months in the hospital, smoke inhalation. But I lived, the fire was so hot that it melted the refrigerator. It was really a bad fire. And I do believe that the reward for the bomber is probably still in existence today. They put out a million dollar reward. And I never found it. Hey, listen, you want to get on the first front page of the New York Times? That's how to do it. What? So we had a neighborhood vet. The vet took the, my dog wasn't the only dog in the building. He took the animals in. And the dog survived. You know, that, yeah, he was awesome. He took all the animals in, and uh, he kept my dog for three weeks until uh, my cousin came and got the dog. But, um, and it, there were lots of masks on the dogs. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah knows how I feel about dogs. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> on a lighter note, what brought you here to San Francisco? The bombing. Um, I, when I recovered, when I got out of the hospital, I did some crisis intervention therapy. Um, and then I decided that I almost died, so I wanted to see all my friends and family that had scattered all over the country. So I got, took a year off from work, and I got in a car, and I started, you know, seeking out my friends and family and traveling across country. And um, when I got to Portland, where Sashi was at the time. Um, my next stop was San Francisco. And when I got here, a friend of mine was, was really sick. His name was Patrick Cowley, he was a record producer. And he, he died three days after I got here. And so his business partner said, hey listen, he had this record label called Megatone Records, and he said, hey, can you watch the label? I need to take Patrick's body back to New York. I said, sure. So two weeks later, Morty comes back, and I said, OK, going off to Yosemite now. And Sylvester was an artist that lived in San Francisco at the time. And he says, you know, you really should stay. We need to put out Patrick's music. So I agreed to stay for one song. And that song was Do You Want a Funk? And it went gold. And the next thing I knew, I was two years later, I was still couch surfing. I decided to find an apartment by a bed. And uh, it took 10 years to get to Yosemite. <laughs> but that's how I got here. What was the Townsend building? Oh. <laughs> the best. The best. The audience giggles. Uh, town, the Townsend building was originally a beer warehouse. Um, and for a short time between the beer warehouse, it tried to be an auto repair shop. But Townsend was a 20,000 square foot building on Townsend Street uh, off the corner of 3rd. It went between Townsend and King Street. And um, we built a nightclub there. And um, it was the home of Pleasure Dome. <laughs> and Club Universe. And Club Universe ended up morphing itself into a Studio 54 of the West Coast, I think. Um, I, uh, I had a friend who started Pleasure Dome and, uh, in, in this place, and he was going to lose it. And uh, the place was going to close. And he said to the guy, you can't close this place. And he said, electricity's off, the water's off, I'm out of here. And I had a liquor license, this guy. So Bill said to him, you know, you can't. Pleasure Dome's a, a hit club. He says, you want it? You can have it for six months. You make it work, cool. You don't make it work, you're out of here. So we were standing there in the dark with flashlights because the electricity was off. And he said, so you want in on this? And I said, sure. And he said, how much money do you have in your pocket? So I had a five and four singles, and he went, OK, you're in. <laughs> so for $9, I got in, and we opened the nightclub. And um, it ended up being the home of the leather community for years and years and years. We did Imsel there, we did Miss San Francisco leather, Miss San Francisco leather, drummer, um, all the fetish balls were there, Stormy Leather did their thing there, Mr. Ass, and uh, that was Townsend. How did you come to produce Imsel? Oh, 
Well, the AIDS crisis was rampant, and what happened was it jumped into the women's community, um, primarily with sex workers, but also with nurses. Uh, Nancy Sawaya was a nurse in our community that was administering to guys with HIV, and um, she got it and died. So there were a group of us that were very concerned that women were not being addressed. Um, we had a conversation with Chuck, Chuck Renslow about how he was doing his contest, and a group of us met one night. Um, the person who really came up with the idea was Kathy Gage, Mistress Kathy. She totally came up with the idea, but Imsel was born in a room where Alan Selby, Jim Ed Thompson, Peter Rapp, <sighs> Patrick Tone, all these dead people, you know, Patrick Toner, Kathy Gage, Sky Renfro, Helen Ravellis, Shadow Horton, and me. I don't think I'm leaving anybody out. And I am, forgive me. Um, and we decided to do this event and raise money for it. So that's how it started. And the women's community, the women's weather community was not on our side. I mean, for a lot of reasons. They didn't like the idea that we had guys involved. They didn't, but we wanted our contest to be welcoming to all women. We didn't, you didn't have to be gay. You could be straight, you could be whatever you were into. So welcoming to all women. So it was, and we got a ton of pushback. And amazingly enough, I recently, last year, had a conversation with someone who will go unnamed, but if I said her name, you'd all know her who remembers it differently. But I'm almost sure I'm right, because I've gone over this with Sky and Jack and other people. Um, we just, we did everything. We, we reinvented San Francisco leather, put it on so that we would have a contestant. We put it out among the, uh, the dominatrix community, who was able to get the word out for us all over the country. And that first year, I think we had 18 or 19 contestants on a stage like that was this big wow. in a club called DVA. <laughs> there was no fan. They couldn't even get all the, all the women on the stage were like crunched up together because you couldn't fit on the stage. And the judges were on the stage. I mean, everyone was on the stage. Um, and uh, I produced it, and my gopher was Patrick Toner, who was IML 85. And um, we just did it. And we raised a little bit of money. And we gave it away, all of it. Which was stupid, because we didn't hold any money back to do it again. So some people came to our rescue, including Chuck Ranslow, Tony de Blas from Drama. And we raised more money. And the following year, we did this insane thing. We rented the gift center which is this very upscale place in San Francisco. And we put on International Miss Leather, with Lamar and Skye as our MCs on a real stage in a place that held a lot of people. And that was pretty much, I mean, kind of how it started. And in those days, we all did everything. We just we stood on the corner and handed out flyers. We did it all. And it was like being back at Sing. We did the scenery, the props, uh, we, wrote, we wrote all the, the stuff, we did all the choreography, and that was pretty much how it started. And you were always backstage. Yeah, I was actually on the next stage to Tucson. No. <laughs> <laughs> how long did you produce it? Why, why did you stop? I don't know. Ten years? Eight years? I don't know. I don't remember. I have to think about how many Amsels there were. Judy Shan, Susie. I don't remember who my last Amsel was. So eight, nine years? So it became a burnout. Um, I, I wasn't particularly burned out, um, but Helen was totally burned out. Kathy got burned out. Jim Ed died, and uh, Patrick was very sick, and the epidemic took a toll on all of us. And um, so 
we passed it on to Linda Lopez. Was that the year of Linda Lopez and Gail Wood? We passed it on to Linda Lopez and Gail Wood, who were these two women, and they were in the Imperial Court community. They did a terrible job. It was awful. They did a terrible job. We took it back. And then, I, and I can't remember if that was before or after, but then after that, Amy cut a deal with Helen? Was it with Helen you cut a deal? Amy cut a deal and we licensed it was all to Amy for a dollar. <laughs> and that's all she wrote. Amy had it after that. Ten years for a dollar per year and our price has, has been ten dollars when I work for and we cannot I'm sure it was in cash, I'm sure, I, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It, so for the sake of the camera, what Pam just said, it was the church on Eureka, the MCC church. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Um, and then Amy got it from there on in just we walked away it's very hard to walk away from the contest because it was our baby and what was amazing is that it brought women in from everywhere women started coming in from Canada and to get your shit over the border was very hard I mean driving it over the border was hard flying it over the border was hard shipping it you know UPS over the border was easier but um, People got stopped and got their, you know, their their stuff taken away, got their floggers taken away, and all their sex toys and whatever. It was very difficult. But people came from everywhere, and we met some pretty incredible people. And a lot of organizations started because people came together with IMSL. And unlike IML, which started out as a beauty contest, IMSL really was a community organization. And we started a dialogue. <laughs> I remember like, the bridging the gap between the women's community and the men's community, or between the gay community and the straight community, and um, all these things we did. And Insulin, in its beginning, was, was fashioned after IML. But I produced drummer, and IML was OK. It was a little boring. So we decided to add fantasies like right away in the second year to just spice it up because we were about the fantasies. We were about, you know, depicting what we did. And there was some super creative shit in those, those early years, for sure. And lucky enough to be in the club, because when we were in the club, I had this extraordinary lighting rig and this great sound system. So we were able to do a lot of special effects for the fantasies and give them extra oomph where you can't do it unless you're in the, you know, club that has that, or a theater. Um, but the dialogue that it started became nationwide, and I do believe that the Leather family was born around that time. Because we all, you could call, you could go to any city in the country, and there was somebody there. I mean, there was someone there you knew, there was someone there to take you around, there was family there. And I really do think that came out of Imsel. Robert Rapp. How different is IMSL today compared to the early days? Well, I'm not on the inner workings of IMSL, but I think IMSL today for sure is like a convention. You know, people come together. I mean, I had a lot of fun last night running into people. I have friendships that will never go away. Cam Lyon, Sarah. I mean, you know, there are people that I stay in touch with that um, I will always love forever. Uh, I don't know that, I'm, I'm not sure what IMSL is doing. I'm, I am removed from it. I admit that. I'm not sure that IMSL was building the same relationships. I imagine it is. I don't think that the women's community today has the same level of stressors that we had then. We had the epidemic, for sure. We had women in general have a lot of issues that we were dealing with and coming out. Having people taking us seriously in the BDSM community was also a big deal. And then people not liking some of the stuff we did, like women really brought blood sports out, and men would go, sorry, Doug, men would go, ah, no, you know? Um, and so making that transition, 
I think was a big deal. Um, and I think it brought us closer together. We had more, more to fight for. Um, today we're fighting for equal rights in marriage and stuff. I think in those days we were fighting for our lives in many ways. And it was different. What's the biggest misconception about you? Uh, 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 oh, uh, what's the biggest misconception about me? I have no idea. So I, I'm right out there. Does anyone have a misconception about me? Am I something that it's not like her? I don't know. I'm not sure what the biggest misconception about me is. That I, that I'm not soft, that I don't have a good heart. People think you're tough, but you I am tough. What do you mean? <laughs> Out comes I was going to say, you got a soft, red boot. I have a soft, red boot. I think that people think that I don't have a whole lot of compassion or I'm not soft. I am. I am the dog rescuer. I just am a dog mommy. I love dogs and people, but I think that um, I show up for people as much as they show up for me. I, I, I think maybe that's it, that they think I'm just too tough. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. So I, you'd have to ask everybody else. <laughs> Dr. Joseph, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.